welcome back to The 1% Show. If you're new here, tune in to hear me spin the yarns with authors, savants, and eccentric humans every week. Today on The 1% Show... Uh, that's what was going through my head, and I just could not focus. I could not focus on any word the teacher was saying. Uh, surrounded by students, and, and I just knew. I, I just knew in that moment that instinctual gut feeling that I had to get the fuck out of here. Every industry has been disrupted, but the educational space, and it's probably the most important sector, right? This is the future of this is the future of the country we're talking about. These kids will go on to do amazing things. Imagine if we taught them at a younger age. You have to understand why you're doing. It. You have to understand why you're learning these things and what relevance it has in your life going forward. Just recently, here in Adelaide, we had a whole riot from students rioting about the prices going up yet again for these massive student loans, and especially people going into it with having no idea what they want to do with their life and not really self. Yeah. aware it, it just yeah. it, it just sort of kills me especially especially when shanika that parents impose this idea that university they they have to do it otherwise they're not seen as a success it drives yeah. me nuts every three months or so i sort of look back and i'm like man i was such a fucking idiot something interesting which might sound crazy to most people the age i hope to live to is about 500 <laughs> fuck yeah i'm your aussie host brandon nengavo and it's time to kick back and enjoy the show let's go You can get a free audiobook by signing up for a 30-day trial. Head to brandonnankavell.com slash audible. That's Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, Nankavell, N-A-N-K-I-V-E-L-L. Again, that's brandonnankavell.com slash audible. I use Audible on the daily and have been for months. I use Audible to integrate reading into my daily activities like my morning walk, cooking food, and driving my car. You can do the same. Now, to be sure that Amazon doesn't bite my ass, I have to tell you guys that The 1% Show has no affiliation with Amazon. All proceeds will go directly into my pocket so I can buy myself a cup of coffee. Thanks, guys, and head to brandonankavell.com slash audible to sign up for your 30-day trial and get a free audiobook. To the listeners listening in right now, We've got Sharnika on the podcast. I'm super excited to have him. Um, so he was a, a medical student and he's come a long way at such a young age too. And actually, uh, what am I trying to say? He's, fuck, let me try that again. <laughs> <laughs> Fun with my words already. Um, I was going to say striked $2 million deals. That doesn't make sense. Awesome. So to the listeners listening in right now, we've got Sharnika on the podcast and I'm super excited to have him. So he's come from a a traditional educational background in the medical field and at such a young age, he's come a long way and achieved some pretty big successes. So he's co-founded two multi-million dollar companies, which is extremely impressive. And Sharnika, I believe you're working on a few other things right now too. So could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for that introduction, Brandon. Uh, I'd just like to say really big fan of your YouTube channel, very regular listener. Um, you know, just to quickly introduce myself and touch on what you've already mentioned. Uh, you know, I am someone from a very traditional educational background. I was a medical student before I actually walked away from that. And, you know, I, there was a lot of learning to be done, but basically I've been involved in a lot of ventures, two of which have gone very well, as Brandon mentioned. Um, currently, I'm working in a digital marketing agency that I've co-founded at the start of this year. Uh, but I'm also very heavily involved in the educational space. And I probably, I, I'd, I'd say that's my biggest passion. Um, one thing I'm really trying to do is promote entrepreneurship in high schools around Australia. And another thing I'm trying to do is improve the service of care that's provided in for and after school care services to primary kids. And that's also, you know, kind of going to tie into this creative idea that I'm trying to push into schools and really sort of reshape the educational space as we know it. Um, so that, that's where I am at the moment. That's a bit about my past. Um, yeah. Dope. So we'll get more into the education side of things a bit later on this podcast. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so to kick off with a few sort of overview questions, um, I'm just wondering what what it was like when you were 14 years old. I'm curious, what was life looking like back then? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's just so interesting how things change so quickly these days. Um, when, you know, when I was 14, I was just in grade nine, and I, I was you know just looking back at that point in time, I'd just gotten into an elite selective entry school. 
Um, basically, my main focus at the time was just doing well in school. And I guess looking back now, it was, it was quite confusing because I didn't know why I was doing well. It was just drilled into me by my parents, who are basically immigrants, um, that, you know, you've got to do well. All the opportunities come by performing well in high school. So you've just got to get the best marks possible. And that's what I worked towards. And it was good enough at the time, I think. Uh, you know, I, I did well enough in my education. I was performing at a high standard. But what I missed was a knowledge of why I was doing this. And that's kind of what my life was like. I, I had no vision really. Um, but you know, it was, it was fun. I was 14. I enjoyed a lot of things. Uh, that, that's, yeah, that's what it was like. Sure. So when you came out of high school, what we call it here in Australia is grade 12, year 12, when, you know, around about 18 years old, when you finish up yeah. with school, uh, what was life looking like then? And what did you see in the future if there was anything? Yeah, it was really interesting. I actually had a pretty strong vision of becoming a doctor and I was, I was quite heavily motivated by that. I actually wanted to start my own hospital one day and that's basically what I was striving to do. When I came out of high school, obviously that's changed quite drastically. Apart from that, uh, again, I was very young. I, I was really excited to start uni, meet new people, get involved in those sorts of things. Um, but I think, you know, from a vision point of view, there was quite a strong lack of why, you know, I wanted to become a doctor. I didn't know why. And that was probably again, what was lacking in that sense, but that's where my head was at. When I I was finishing up high school. Mm, and I think it's a similar story for many around that age bracket, yeah, sort of yeah. pursuing something that they're not quite sure why they're doing it. They, they've never stepped back and quite questioned it. So it's really interesting to have you on the podcast who's a few years ahead of that now and, and has sort of found some kind of clarity. Um, yeah. So I guess what what then does a typical day look like for you right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the best thing for me, for my typical day, is just I've got a lot of flexibility in what I do. And just because, you know, my my day is dedicated or it, it's predicated on what I choose to do. And the only consistency and constancy is my morning routine and my bedtime routine, um, which that that's basically something that I have quite fixed, um, which we can, I guess, talk about later. But for the most part, I do a brain dump every night, um, plan out what my next day needs to be like, schedule everything in. And then I find that sort of schedule is really good and it works quite well for me. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, how did you actually get into, this sounds like you're coming at an angle of self-development, and I'm wondering yeah, how you yeah. got into the self-development scene, how you started reading books, and, and how you got into mm. the startup scene, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, like I said, I, I used to be a medical student, and my life was really structured, you know, uni lectures all day, come home, do some homework, but I decided to take a year off from that, um, just due to a lack of passion, I guess, and in that year off, I it was a, it was just a huge learning curve for me, and basically, uh, I stumbled around a lot, I was, you know, watching all these YouTube videos, some were interesting, some were useless, uh, I also did a lot of networking, and I was kind of mentored by a couple of people who showed me the you know, basic ropes of entrepreneurship, they recommended a few books to me, uh, which I found really useful and it really blew my mind i was just like there's a whole world of learning that you just don't see and to come across it you've got to go out you've got to go outside the bubble you've got to do things on your own and i think a book that really changed my perspective uh was a book called um well actually there was a couple of books but one of them was the lean startup uh which changed my perspective of you know business and startups and that that whole world and there was another book called thinking fast and slow which was phenomenal for me as well uh but you know once i got started on that i i just sort of realized there's so much to learn and it, it just flowed from there and you know from there i've probably read over 300 books now um i've spent a lot of money on self-development and i pride myself on you know learning things every single day uh, i just think that's probably the most valuable thing i've been able to do despite everything else mm, no question about it i can definitely relate i'm not one to regret things in life because I, yeah. I, I don't believe in regret but when i look back at my high school life i'm thinking if there's one thing i should have done differently uh not that i would have known at the time but it would be to read more books man like even in yeah. like i got a few detentions back in high school i'm thinking what if i filled in that time by educating myself and feeding my mind with these great books yeah <laughs> i think it'd be incredible uh, but my no, next it's... my next question sorry to cut you off but my next question for you shanika is uh how has your life experience uh, affected your views on the current education system sure uh, I, I think that's such an interesting question because like i said before i, I came from a really structured background um you know i, I come from a um, background where my parents came from overseas they're really hard-working parents but i think they were sort of stuck in the environment they grew up in and that was sort of shifted onto me and you know, I worked very hard without any real vision or goal as to why I was doing that. And because of that, because I had that background, given what I'm doing now, I feel like I've got a lot more perspective than a lot of people. Uh, just because a lot of people don't have that shift. They, 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 people question things, but they don't really have the context to lay it out like that. So because I've had that, I, I kind of have a much greater appreciation, I think, 
um, as to why I think the education system needs to change. I think the education system as a whole, well, it was built, it hasn't changed in hundreds of years. And it was built really in the industrial revolution where you were training people to learn certain content and to become workers, basically. Whereas we know that in this world, to be successful and to make it, you're not, you're not learning for the sake of knowing things. You're learning to learn. You're learning to teach yourself to learn and go out and be independent and do things on your own. And I, I think the education system's failed us in that sense. Um, yeah. mm, sure thing. And just an interesting note to add uh, to both you, Sharnika, and, and my fans listening in, uh, the Industrial Revolution, Sharnika mentioned, uh, it's something that's really quite interesting, but sounds really boring on the surface level. Like, oh, the Industrial yeah, yeah. Revolution happened in the 1700s or whatever. It sounds really boring, but it's just amazing how much that uh, era has is still affecting us now here in 2017. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of old remnants that have, are still affecting us, like the education system. It's extremely outdated, in my opinion, um, and it's just carrying on from the industrial era and we haven't really updated it um yeah and i think there's a book called the story of the human body by daniel lieberman so if you're interested in reading um more about the industrial era then that is like uh, one book i i highly recommend to both you shanika and uh yeah, listeners listening in right now really interesting uh but my next question shanika is uh, in that case, what changes would you like to see in the education system? Sorry, in the education system or schools in general? Yeah, um, I think you know th- this is a huge question, and you know th- it, it just depends on so many factors. But like I said, I think <clears> the problem is um, a lot of students, not not just in high school, but even from primary school, they they don't understand why they're there. And I think that's just such a huge failure of the system that you know you've you've got to teach people the reason why they're there. And I guess you know this as well as I do, just because of the self development we've done. But we know that motivation and a reason for why you're doing something is critical um, to be successful, to be happy, to be fulfilled. So from a very basic point of view, I think that needs to change. You need to you know, help people understand what they want from life, what, what they're working towards. Not just that, I think the way people learn needs to change as well. So again, you know, going to probably the best high school in Melbourne, even in that high school, we, we were basically copying notes of whiteboards, learning content, writing down equations, watching, watching this old teacher write all these notes that we had to then take off a black board onto our books and you know you, you think about that and you think about everything that's possible in this day and age and you're just like i can't believe that's what's being taught in high schools these days and this is you know probably one of the most advanced high schools in the state imagine imagine people who don't even have access to that people who live in rural areas mm. it just there's so many opportunities to change that and i think every industry has been disrupted but the educational space and it's probably the most important sector right this is the future of this is the future of the country we're talking about these kids will go on to do amazing things imagine if we taught them at a younger age you have to understand why you're doing it. You have to understand why you're learning these things and what relevance it has in your life going forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just like the simplest change you can put in. Mm-hmm. And if you did that, it'd be huge. And I guess in addition to that, you know, we, we've talked about self-development now and, you know, the importance of learning. Just something as simple as instilling that kind of thing within schools. Um, I think you really ins- instill a lot of value there and you teach, you make people want to be there. Uh, for me, I went to high school and I enjoyed it because I got to hang out with my mates, you know, recess and lunchtime was what I looked forward to. I never really looked forward to classes and i think that's a shame um now I, I love what i do i look i look forward to the learning and the work that i'm involved in but if we can instill that at a young age i just think the progression is going to be exponential mm. so i i believe there's a really interesting change that's going to come in the next five to ten years in humanity as a whole but if we can affect the educational industry that's going to be accelerated even further uh, mm. and i think it starts with education personally so I, i'd like to see an actual very large overhaul in the way education is done and that starts in what you're teaching people why you're teaching these things um, and helping people realize why they're there as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I resonate uh, much of, of with what you're saying. And I spend a lot of time in my head analyzing things, uh, analyzing how things work, way, the way the world works, the way interactions work, and what can yeah. be improved. I spend a lot of time in my head 24-7. And mm. whenever I, I, I like to think of how can we, you know, make the world peaceful, how can we make the world a better place, I think a lot of people think about that and try to make actions towards it. And what keeps coming back to me is education. Because if you think about it, humans are the cause of all good things and bad things, I guess, in Correct. a sense. exactly. Um, and human life starts when you're zero years old, when you come out of your mother's womb, right? And yeah, so exactly. the very first thing you're hit with, especially in those critical years, like age zero to 18, when your brain's, you know, highly sensitive to 
creating neural pathways in your brain, like education yeah. plays a huge role. And a lot of, oh, for sure. you know, time spent in children's life is at school. Like half their day yeah. is literally school. So what they're taught mm. there, what's being fed into their brains is extremely important and will create an impact on, you know, humanity uh, later in life as they go out into yeah. their lives and start doing shit. So if they're not educated, right, then, you know, I just feel like education is such a important point that hasn't quite been addressed as much as you know other things so yeah, yeah. well there's just, a whole just expanding <laughs> on that. sorry to cut you off but go for it it's, go just, for it's it. just so it's just so interesting uh, i'm glad we're on the same page but um i, I just think like, like you're saying you know these young kids is so important and what they're going through at the moment is going to shape the way they perceive things for the next 40 to 50 years to a large extent and i don't think we give them enough credit i think you know we kind of mollycoddle these kids almost and we, we believe they've got to be walked through every step of the way but really if we give them a little bit more responsibility and allow them to make, you know, some independent decisions. I think we'd be amazed at how uh, versatile and creative kids would be. And just just because I work, I happen to work with children every single day of the week. That's something I've made it a point to do. I, I've told them from the very start, I'm not here to teach you things. I'm here to facil- facilitate that learning. It's up to you to learn. And just giving them that level of independence changes so much. And you, you can see they take a lot more responsibility in what they're learning as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's just amazing okay. how much effect we can have. Sure. And out of interest, what do you believe are the best lessons you've learned either from your parents or through the traditional educational system, just to add a different perspective? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's quite interesting. I think, um, for, well, from, from the background I had, I've gotten a lot more value. I, I, I just have a lot more appreciation for education as a whole. And whilst I think it can be optimized and it needs to be um, changed, uh, I believe the resources I've obtained obtained and you know the opportunities that were given to me uh, I, I'm, I'm very thankful for that you said because you don't believe in regrets and I completely agree with that you know I wouldn't have had it any other way because it's given me the appreciation I have right now um, so in that sense I'm glad that the opportunities are there I just think it's coming in the wrong way that's one thing um, the second thing is I think it teaches people structure uh, I think it gives people direction in some te- in some context you know where we're taught to strive to be better we're taught to aim for goals uh, those things are important okay yeah. sure thing and how about in terms of subject selection at school and the subjects you're actually given because mm-hmm. in my high school it was like you know you do maths you choose a certain level yeah. of maths either easy maths or smart maths um, they all have different names maths apps maths application <laughs> and blah 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 um, you know there's maths there's science there's biochemistry whatever there's uh fitness there's you know a whole variety of topics and you're just sort of pushed into doing all of yeah. them and I, I suppose it's good to expose yourself to to a variety of different subjects to see where your strengths lie but uh you know for five years of high school if you're yeah. still doing the same subject that doesn't resonate with you or your strengths then i'm Correct. thinking shouldn't shouldn't we make a change here and let mm. you know maybe four years of high school be a place where you can just focus and knuckle down on your strengths and sort of like yeah. what you were born you know to do uh, i don't know if you have mm. any thoughts on that yeah yeah i think it's 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 a really interesting point and it's it's a bit of a difficult thing to argue as well just because it's going to be very hard to check mm-hmm. um, just given i guess the bureaucracy around it but i i'm in agreement with you i think you know at the age of let's say 14 through to 18 you know you're asking these kids one to make decisions that will define the rest of their life potentially uh but secondly you're pushing them in certain directions to do that as well and i think again we're we're, we're probably not giving people enough credit we're not giving children enough credit in their capacity to make uh, informed decisions to learn and be better rather than just pushing subjects down their throat. You know, we're taught maths, science, English, they're important subjects, you should do them. And then you can choose between arts, photography, media, but it's still it's still so controlled, right? We don't really have a choice where we're given these options that a school has determined for us, but you're not really teaching the right things. They're still so content focused. Uh, I don't personally believe we should be teaching content from prep through to year 12. I think Mm -hmm. there's a place that content has. There's essential learnings that you need to know. Uh, But I think we can cover that in probably half the time, potentially. And then, you know, once people are at an age where they can, you know, define their own path, they they should be able to explore that. And it shouldn't be predetermined for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the interesting thing is it's being explored, um, perhaps not from a government point of view, but private private, private companies are exploring these things. And I know even within Australia, there's a number of companies that are looking into this and trying to promote these events um, amongst schools and independently as well. And I'm interested to see what direction that takes. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's ripe for disruption. I think there's enough people that know that for it to happen. I don't know exactly where it's going to come from, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting thing. It's, it's a really interesting stage we're at, I think. Mm. 
Definitely. And could you expand on what you mentioned earlier about what you're doing to sort of tackle this problem? Because you, you seem to be, you know, getting in touch with universities or schools or whatever you said. I'm just keen to hear more about that. Yeah, definitely. I think um, my, my I'm not completely tying into problem yet, but what I believe is from an entrepreneurial point of view, we don't get the opportunity in high schools to explore that. And I think it's, it's just a shame because everyone in high schools, uh, they're studying for university, basically, or they're studying for TAFE or, or for other kind of courses and degrees. And there are so many people with so much potential in high school that if you gave them an avenue to explore that, I think we'd see phenomenal things at such a young age. I know for me personally, had I had an opportunity, I don't know if I would have explored it or not, but it would have given me the chance. And I wouldn't have had to have waited four years after high school to do that. So that's what I'm trying to provide. I'm trying to get into high schools and incentivize these kids to work through entrepreneurship. So I basically, I, I'm in the process of starting a not-for-profit organization, setting up real world challenges and putting people into teams to solve these problems and then actually get them to pitch to investors uh, or to a panel where they can seek funding, they can seek prize money. And yeah, I'm, I'm just giving them the independence to go and do that. Mm. So the goal is give people an avenue to pursue this. And if they love it, you know, we're going to see great things. And if they don't, at least they know that. Um, mm. So that's what I'm trying to promote. I'm trying to push it through high schools. I've also uh, been fortunate enough to get some interest from a university in Victoria. And they, they've shown you know a great level of interest. And they'd like to sort of help facilitate that as well, which I think is great. Um, yeah, so that's, that's mm. what I'm doing at the moment. Mm. Absolutely fantastic. Big moves. You're an action taker. I love to hear that. Love to hear that. Um, So next up, we've got what are the top three lessons you've learned through self-education as opposed to traditional education? If you had to sum up the top three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many, but I think one thing I've sort of realized is um, through self-education, you you really understand there's no real ceiling to potential. And that's a barrier that took me a bit of time to break. But um, traditional education, it teaches you what to learn. I think we need to learn how to learn in today as well and you know the creativity and the independence that comes through learning on your own through reading through mentoring um, through you know learning from other people I think it just teaches you that really actually anything's within your capacity to learn and to become basically and that that's that's one thing you know there's no ceiling to where you can go that's a massive barrier especially given the way some people are raised and the environment they're in they already have a ceiling you know by the time they're in high school they mm-hmm. feel like this is the ceiling for me I can't go any further than that and I think that's wrong I think for pretty much anyone in Australia and most countries they they have a lot more potential than that secondly um, there's two two fantastic books that have really changed my perspective on um, education as a whole and it was The Talent Code and Outliers and it touches on what you were talking about uh, in terms of how people's brains are shaped by myelin and The Talent Code actually goes into that a lot so I'd actually recommend both of these books. Outliers is basically a book that goes through all these examples of people's scenarios and how we perceive someone who's successful as oh they were just brilliant, they had all this talent and they they were so lucky, they're amazing and we can't ever become that. But it goes through the context of every single success successful person we know of basically and it shows how it wasn't just raw luck and it wasn't just talent that got them there there's a specific set of circumstances that they had and you kind of realize um through that anyone can be anything you know there, there's a certain level of circumstance of control and i think through self-education you you can if you can understand that um it really breaks again the ceiling that you have for yourself and you realize there's no reason why i can't become X or why I can't go on to build this or why I can't start this. Mm. Um, so they're two of the books that really sold that for me. But, of, you know, there's, there's thousands of books that can do that, uh, but they're two of the best for me. Uh, the other thing, the standard mode of education, the standard stream of education we have available to us, it may not necessarily be the best way for us to make progress. Uh, you know, I'm not here to sort of tell people which direction they should go in, but, you know, I've sort of come to realize for different people and just sort of depending on where you're at, uh, you you should go and explore other things. And the best way to do that is through self-education. Some gold nuggets there. Yeah, thank you very much, Shanika. I resonate much with what you're saying, especially the uh, breaking the ceiling um, scenario. Uh, Just to add a few points on that, that is something that's uh, really popped up for me only recently. And just some thoughts I want to add here is that your life is a projection of how you see yourself. So now I'm not the first person to say that. That's quoted by many people. But I now understand it on an emotional level. So to really break through the ceiling, for me, just what I've found is, yes, like books help and everything. But um, what really triggered me was surrounding myself 
by people that are smarter than with me and believe mm. in me more than I do myself. And it's a very common saying. I think uh, I forgot who said it, but you know, you're the average of the five people you surround yeah. yourself with. So yeah. through like mentorship and surrounding myself with these higher minds, uh, that really helped me break the barrier. So for example, to put this in practical terms, uh, you know, two years ago, a year ago, I never thought I would be reaching out to these best-selling authors, you know, like yeah. uh, James Fadiman, author of the Psychedelic mm. Explorer's Guide, uh, Johan Hari, author of Chasing the Scream, uh, you know, I'm just reaching out to Gary Vaynerchuk, Wim Hof, all these like big superstars. And that's yeah. something a lot of people don't even think of doing. It doesn't even come across their radar. And this shit never came across my radar until yeah. I learned to break through the ceiling. Uh, and it, literally all it is, is you go to their website, find their contact in and send off an email that's all it is but you know yeah. what it takes to build up the confidence and like the holy shit i can actually do this to go yep. do that it, it, it can take a lot for some people like it did me so mm. breaking through that ceiling um yeah my two bits on it is you know surround yourself with with higher minds uh that that yeah. really helps me i just wanted to add that in there <laughs> no, no i completely agree I, I think that's something that's really underappreciated by a lot of people but the environment you're in the people you're around it makes a huge difference it, it basically you know what could have taken 10 years to do you can do it a year mm. if you're around the right people mm -hmm. that's for sure mentorship mentorship is just uh, absolutely incredible anyway moving on um back to this education thing i'm just wondering what's the best piece of advice you'd have for teenagers just coming out of high school but they're not sure what they want to do should they take a gap year go straight to university or something else yeah great question i think you know, I, I don't think I'm here to give you a step-by-step -step process. And I, I don't think you should have a step-by-step -step process here. But I think the big thing is you've got to invest in yourself. And, you know, to quantify what that means, uh, you know, I'm, I'm such a big believer that the world today is more accessible than ever before. And it's getting more and more accessible every single day. There's no excuse for anyone in today's world to say, oh, I don't have the opportunity to learn because mm -hmm. I think you do. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is go and learn, go and listen, read, uh, listen to podcasts, read books, watch things on YouTube. There's just a sea of opportunity. And, and as you become involved in that, you'll get immersed and you'll just come across all these things because that's what's, ha that's what's happened to me. And and to people I've mentored and to people I've, uh, I guess, been involved with, that's how they went about it as well. And as you do that, you get more and more direction as to what you want to become, where you want to go, and you just have direction and purpose. And from there, you can make your choice, right? You can decide, is going to uni the best idea for me? Should I take a gap year to learn more? What you decide to do, you, you need to have, you need to have some context for that. And you shouldn't make that decision lightly. I think you have to, um, you know, basically go and learn and find out more about yourself, more about the world, more about what you can do and become. So that, that's basically what I would say, you know, invest in yourself, learn all these things, find out more about what you're passionate about, and then you can make an informed decision. Mm, sure thing. All right, here's, here's a more challenging one for you. Now, I don't know whether either of us are qualified to, I mean, we're humans, we can share our opinions, but maybe we're not yeah. qualified per se. But anyway, I'll ask it anyway because it will make us think. And that is mm. for someone that has never delved into the self-development scene or becoming self-aware and investing in themselves, they are dead smack bang in the middle of university. You know, they've taken out a loan. Uh, they're dead smack bang in the middle of a degree, but they don't like what they're doing and they, they know that they're not going to pursue this in the future. It really doesn't resonate with them. And at the same time, they're just getting into and learning about self-development. Uh, what what would you do in that scenario? Would you continue or would you drop yeah. out? That is the question. Yeah, like this is this is a very tough question. Mm -hmm. And like you said, I'm not going to sit here and you know pretend to be an expert in this, and I'm not going to sort of try and give you any go-to things for this. I think you have to be careful what you advise people on. But mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll, I'll talk about it from my point of view as well as a dear friend of mine who is in a similar situation who is now doing incredibly well. Um, I think one thing to avoid is a sunk cost fallacy. So a decision I had to make when I was in medical school, you know, I was two years in, I had reasonably good grades. There wasn't a long way to go for me. And in, in, in a lot of ways, I felt like to walk away from that was such a waste of two years. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, you know, if, if you think logically, it doesn't quite make sense, right? Because if, if it's not, it's, it's, if it's not what you want to do, spending another three years just because you've committed yourself to something is just another three years you're going to waste. Mm -hmm. um, and there was someone else who was in a similar situation who, you know, he was bouncing around degrees and he finally settled on uh, an aerospace degree and he spent three years, no, two, two years in that degree. But he was really starting to immerse himself in 
self-develop and he was starting to realize, hold on, there is a world of opportunity here. And he was progressing very, very quickly in, in, in the self-development schemes. Um, that, that's my advice. In terms of what you would do, I think keep learning. You know, like I, like I said before, the more you learn, the more you understand, the clearer your vision becomes and the more clarity you have. And it just gives you, it puts you in the right position to make this. Um, I, I agree it's such a hard decision to make, mm-hmm. but you've got to make an informed decision. And it, to be informed, you need to know what your purpose is, what, what you're passionate about, what you want to go and do in the world. And it's not always going to align with what you're studying at uni. It perhaps won't even align by what you're learning at the time, but you need a bit more clarity before you make that call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, love it. Love it, Shanika. Uh, so I'm just going to fill in a bit about my story to add some value here sure. for maybe even you, Shekanika, and the listeners as well, definitely. Um, sure. Um, I won't go into huge detail because we could be here all day, but basically I was in this exact position, which is why I ask on your thoughts. I think it's really interesting to hear another perspective. And, you know, I studied IT for a year and a half, did a Bachelor of IT at uh, the University of South Australia. Um, and I, I never really thought about it much. I'm like, okay, sort of the, going through the school system, everyone was going to uni. So I just sort of, you know, followed, you know, followed the herd. I didn't, I didn't really have much self-awareness. I wasn't into self-development. So that's just what I did. That's just seemed to be what everyone was doing. And so, you know, I took a gap here and then I, I, I went into IT. Uh, it was all right for the first six months. Um, you know, pretty sure like, you know, any student's career, but after six months, I don't know. I, I was at this time reading a lot of books, heavily involved in books. Uh, and I think I had just started my YouTube channel. I was really into the self-development game. And you just every single freaking day, I was filling my mind with thoughts from big thought leaders like Gary Vaynerchuk and, and you know, tons of others, tons of others. Mm. And it got to a point where a year and a half through... I just sort of started to rattle and I knew IT wasn't what I wanted to do and I'd taken out a student loan and I was paying more and more money and yeah. it was just sort of when my head started to turn and think, I'm like, what am I actually doing? Um, and so I thought, okay, fuck it. I ditched the IT degree and then I uh, signed up for the marketing degree. So I was more interested mm-hmm. in marketing at the time, um, you know, learning social media marketing and, and doing this YouTube channel and selling products online like eBooks. I was doing that in my spare time. And so I thought, all right, I'll do a marketing degree then. And so I literally only lasted about, I don't know, a couple weeks. Um, mm. A couple weeks into that, I remember I was sitting in the lecture hall with my friend uh, Adriana. I don't think she'll mind me using her name in this podcast. We're sitting in there and I just, I, I, I just lost it. Like I, I could not sit still. I had recently recently earned like my first 100 or 200 dollars an hour just for having a, a youtube coaching session where i had a lot of fun and i made friends and i thought hang on a minute so i just made 200 dollars with one hour of my time doing something I love. What the fuck am I yeah. doing in this lecture hall doing something I, I'm not even interested in? I'm going into debt and I'm just thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? Uh, that's what was going through my head and I just could not focus. I could not focus on any word the teacher was saying. Uh, surrounded by students and, and I just knew, I, I just knew in that moment that instinctual gut feeling that I had to get the fuck out of here. I knew it in every bone, heart, soul, lungs in my body. I had to get out of there and I was texting my, my mentors. I'm like, fuck, what am I doing? here one said no don't leave and the other one said fuck it do do you and so that's exactly what i did and it felt right so you know from that day on i i ran out of university and i've been doing uh what i'm doing since now i'm no millionaire right now but i'm pretty close to sustaining a lifestyle where financially where i'm doing what i love which is fantastic and i i I wake up every single day feeling awesome and i that's one of the best decisions i've ever made in my life um now with that said that doesn't mean if someone in this position uh, should make that decision because I actually believe it's it's a great thing to uh, sort of be ahead of your game in terms of having something built up online whether you know maybe you do something on the side during university maybe you build up a social following or build a store or just start experimenting and getting to know yourself investing in yourself like you say Shanika uh, before you just jump the gun I think there's a few things to consider but other than that I'm uh, I'm really I don't know, it's, it's, it's funny to admit on a podcast, but I've already said it on my channel and I'm a huge advocate of self-education as opposed to university. I just, we could go on, on many yeah. tangents here, but you know, the, the steep costs of rising loans is insane. Just recently here mm-hmm. in Adelaide, we'd had a whole riot from students writing about the prices going up yet again for these massive student loans and especially people going into it with having no idea what they want to do with their life and not really self-aware. Yeah. It, it just, yeah. it, it just sort of kills me, especially, especially 
especially when Shanika, that parents impose this idea that university, they, they have to do it, otherwise they're not seen as a success. It drives yeah. me nuts. Like, I met people there, one of my friends, and they were pursuing a degree purely because their parents believed that there was more opportunity in this so-called subject, which she didn't actually enjoy doing. So, after talking yeah. with me, she did end up switching her degree. That was more in line with what she liked. But it's just crazy to me, especially when parents impose this idea of what they should do without actually listening Correct. to them. I, I, it just drives me nuts. I don't know if you've got anything to add there, but that's just me going no, on a big no. rant. No, no, I, I love it. You know, it, it just, I think it's got to resonate with how a lot of people feel. <clears throat> and it's something that really frustrates me. And that's where, you know, a lot of my passion comes from as well. You know, I think, you know, we're, we're failing, we're failing our children. You know, we're failing the kids in today's world with what they're provided. And one big thing I strongly believe is we, we live in an era of abundance today where, you know, you, there's so much available to you that you shouldn't be stuck doing something you're forced to do or something you're not passionate about because you can succeed in anything. And if you, if you can find what you love, you can find a way to make it in that, mm-hmm. in that space. So I think, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's such a, you know, heartbreaking, but also motivating story to hear because mm-hmm. yeah, De- definitely. I think there's so many people in that position. Mm-hmm. For sure. And that's and that's why I bring it up because, you know, much of my audience is actually, you know, young males in their 20s, even females too, yeah, that yeah. are in this stage of their life. And, and it's just crazy. We're here in 2017. And like you were saying earlier, Shanika, is that the world is full of opportunity. If you're listening to this podcast right now, listeners listening, and if you're listening to this right now, you've got a freaking like mobile device in your hand that gives you access to like the fucking the world's library of of information and, and connections. You can talk to people through video call. Like, look at me and Shanika talking right now we're like yeah. we're exchanging knowledge and we're learning from each other and you guys are learning too and and you you just you can make an online store straight from your mobile phone you can you can do so many things like the opportunities are just incredible completely agree yeah it's it's amazing Huh. So, Sharnika, uh, unless there's anything else you want to add in terms of, you know, the education system, um, we might move on to some fun questions, which are some questions by Tim Ferriss. No, it sounds great. I think, you know, we've, we've certainly raised some really interesting points that hopefully give some thought to what people are going through at the moment. And, you know, if they can reflect on these sorts of points and take some action based on that, you know, mm. that, that's the biggest thing. I think we've covered enough to allow that opportunity to happen. Definitely. One last thing I might add is that I did go on a little rant there. Uh, I do have deep respect for for teachers. The thing is, yep. te- teachers don't necessarily have control over the education Correct. system. So I know there are a lot of teachers out there that do believe in this sort of stuff that we can change the way we educate, but they don't necessarily have the power to overturn yeah. that whole thing. Exactly. No, I, I completely agree. But anyway, moving on, um, Shanika, when you think of the word successful, who's the first person that comes to mind and why? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's just so many people given, uh, you know, everything I've learned over the last few years. But if I was to pick one single person, um, it, it'd be probably Tony Robbins. And I'd, I'd just recommend everyone listening to go and check him out. I think my, my um, for me, my meaning of success is empowering others and, you know, allowing other people to do great things and become better than you are. And I think that's really what Tony Robbins' goal is. You know, if you know anything about him, he basically, uh, he's a peak performance coach and he changes the lives of millions of people every single year through the seminars and coaching sessions that he runs. I happened to attend one last year. There was about 5,000 people in a room and I was very skeptical. I was like, how can you possibly have an impactful event in front of 5,000 people over 12 hours, days, five days? Uh, but, you know, I walked away from that and it was probably the most life-changing experience I've ever had. Um, you know, I think once you listen to him, you can see how empowering he is. And it's not just short-term changes he makes. He, he teaches you the principles to go out and make definitive change in your life for the better. Mm. Um, just an incredible guy. And, you know, if you want to know the people he's worked with, Serena Williams credits a lot of her success to him. Uh, Barack Obama credits a lot of his success in the public eye to him. Tim Ferriss, one of his main idols. Basically, all these public figures, they, they credit a lot of what they do to a conversation they've had with him or something they've listened to from him. Um, just YouTube him. He's got the fourth most TED Talk ever, I believe, uh, Why We Do What We Do. But he's someone I respect incredibly, and he's, he's just doing phenomenal things for the world. Mm, definitely. The amount of research that man has put into figuring out how life works and how to live the best yeah. life possible is just incredible. Uh, I do want to ask, could you walk us through how it felt and exactly what scenarios went down on a typical day at the Tony Robbins seminar? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, like, did you do the fire walk? Did you get up yeah. and dance? And like, what happened? All of it. <laughs> I mean, I was, I'm someone who's a bit of a skeptic, uh, in general about things like that. So I think for me to have been converted is, is a pretty powerful statement. But, um, we, we did do the firework, firewalk and the premise of it was we go in with pre-built beliefs and actually we, we apply a ceiling to ourselves that we believe we can't cross. 
And the premise of the firewalk is you can do things you don't think you can do. You know, not, not a lot of people believe they can walk across fire. And it's not the physical act of doing it, but it's just overcoming that belief, which is sort of a metaphor for your life as well. You know, um, I'll just give you one example. One exercise he made us do is, um, you know, think of the worst thing in your life right now. Um, you know, the one thing you're most ashamed of or you're most fearful of that you're just unable to break. And, you know, considering most of the people in this room, they, they have a lot of life experience. They're 30, 40, 50 year olds. Um, um, there was a really powerful story with the woman next to me. She's someone who uh, is a very, very heavy smoker, um, cigarette smoker, and she's been smoking two packets a day for the last 20 years or something like that. And she said a week before she came to this seminar, the reason she came was because she saw her 13-year-old daughter picking up a cigarette and smoking it, which is, you know, obviously devastating for her. And she said, um, you know, that, that was when I realized I, I can't do this anymore. I can't let my children fall into the same habits that I've felt. And Tony Robbins took us through this exercise where you basically... Um, um, I guess plan out what your life will look like in a month's time, three months' time, in six months' time, in a year's time, in ten years' time, if you don't if you don't do anything about this. And you know, the reaction of the room is something I've never really experienced before because you had people bawling their eyes out, people rolling on the ground, so much agony in what their life would look like five years' time if they don't change what they're doing. And the point he was trying to make is to truly change your life, you have to realize how painful the alternative is. And I'm still in contact with that lady today. Um, I actually spoke to her about a week or two ago, and she says she hasn't touched a cigarette since that day. And she hasn't even felt tempted. So in the past, when she's tried to quit, she's given in to temptations, she's wavered, she's faltered, and she's had to go through this, you know, uh, basically the system where she gives in, she comes back, she gives in, she comes back. But that moment was when she realized, I can't keep doing this. And it was too painful for her to smoke a cigarette. So she doesn't even feel tempted anymore. So that was just so powerful for me because I realized, you know, the motivations needed for someone to change what they're doing right now. There's, there's a certain set of circumstances that need to be applied. And um, it was just it was just so eye-opening. Mm. In terms of what else he covered in that, you know, he, he got people into peak states. You know, he, the reason you see people dancing up and down, going crazy, it gets you into a mindset and a zone where what you cover makes a lot more sense. It gives you a lot more purpose. And you're in a state where you can apply these things that he's teaching. Um, and it's it's something that I apply to this day. You know, part of my morning routine is to get myself to a peak state. Is what I learned from that seminar, actually. It's a, it's a 10 minute routine I go through. And I'm so focused and so driven when I wake up and do that process after I've meditated that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. And, you know, I make the most out of most days now, just, just for a couple of things like that. Are you open to spilling the beans on how you do that routine exactly? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a publicly available track. So he went, he took us through this ritual called a priming routine. And, you know, you can Google Tony Robbins priming exercise and it'll come up. It's basically a 15 minute process where you close your eyes. It's like, you know, really peaceful music and you give appreciation for what you have. You know, the little things, you know, the, the feelings on your skin, what you're sitting next to, the wind on your face. And then he takes you to a few key experiences in your life. Um, a couple of coincidences maybe where one coincidence which happened to change your life today. And for me, it was just a coffee I had in the sky, which I think was a big factor in me dropping out of it. And I was just like, you know, that was just such a big coincidence that that happened, which is literally the reason I'm where I am today. And it just makes you feel really thankful for what you have, but also the opportunity is similar to that going forward. And um, you basically make a pledge to serving each moment of your life um, in a productive, motivating way. Um, and yeah, that, that's just a very brief summary, but I think you've got to listen to that tape to really understand it. And I, I recommend everyone go through that. Mm. It's probably a 10 to 15 minute tape. You can find it on YouTube. Um, mm. And it's, it was incredibly empowering. And, you know, to for me, I do it every single day. You know, it's, it hasn't worn off or anything like that. It's a process you go through every single day and it just gives you so much more appreciation for life as a whole I think. Sure what I love about what you've done there is you've actually followed up someone who had a transformative experience and and you know checked mm -hmm. to see if this person had actually uh you know sustained it and you know yeah. I, like many, maybe listeners, you know, listening in right now have watched the documentary, I Am Not Your Guru with Tony Robbins. Yeah. And, you know, I have a sort of a skeptical and rational mind a bit like you. And just seeing, I thought, oh, maybe they didn't include the people who, you know, didn't sustain their success or anything. And so for mm. you to actually, to get your perspective on it, someone who's actually been there as an audience member and then actually followed up another member who had a transformative experience really yeah. uh, sheds <laughs> light on some of my skepticalness, if that's a word. No, no, I, I <laughs> I completely agree because I, I was exactly like that. You know, I, I went because I've heard amazing. There was people I respected who recommended him. Uh, however, I didn't expect to get that much out of it. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a pretty expensive program. So I, I didn't expect to get, you know, that kind of value back, but it was probably, you know, 10 to 100 fold value. Oh, 
Uh, okay, okay, so here's an interesting question then. Obviously, for business owners who are earning the dollar dollar bills uh, in excess, um, you know, five grand isn't that much to them to pay mm. for a seminar like this. But how about to like, I don't know, corporate people with nine to fives, maybe they earn, I don't know, 50K a year, 40K a year. Sure. And it, it would take a significant amount of time to save up yeah. for this event. Um, do you reckon that's uh, worth the five grand as opposed to spending that five grand on maybe books or <laughs> other things of that nature? Right, right. Yeah, so that, that's a tough question to answer because I think you can spend money in very productive ways. Um, having said that, I think the difference in this course is, it, you know, we've talked about education and how it needs to come in the right way. And what I valued here is, you know, there wasn't a very strict step-by-step process he ran you through, but what he made every single person realize is they can be better than they are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talked about this ceiling we have for it for people or for ourselves and how it's very hard to break that for most people. Um, I, I would be very confident in saying, you know, 90% of people in that room walked out believing they could be better than they thought they would be able to. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's a priceless experience because, you know, 5K, it's, it's actually this, this program is probably a K, um, a grand, the UPW course, the Unleash the Power Within course. Uh, I'd say well worth. Mm. Is UPW online or in person? It's in person. So oh. if you're in Australia, it's in Sydney. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, well worth a thousand in my opinion. Wow. Fuck yeah. I'd take that. Like, like that's a no brainer to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Ass. Thanks for making us aware of that. My next question is, what is something you believe that other people think is insane? Right. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take your time, dude. Okay. So, okay. I, I think what I believe is that everyone is probably wrong in what they think they can accomplish. Um, for example, through self-development and through learning what I've learned, every three months or so, I sort of look back and I'm like, man, I was such a fucking idiot three months ago. <laughs> and people sort of go through their life giving them, boxing themselves in and giving themselves you know, a restriction on what they can become. I would kind of say every single person is wrong. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm wrong. You're wrong. And, it, you know, you keep learning and you keep uncovering more about what you be. Uh, and that's a big thing, I believe. The other big thing is we've talked about, you know, from an educational sense, but I, I believe, and I'm not saying this is the truth or anything like that, but I believe because you have, you have the flexibility, you have all these options available to you. Whether you're learning biology, you can, you know, get a much better, better education online than you can in a uni degree. Guaranteed, right? Everything they're teaching you is available mm-hmm. and accessible online. Mm-hmm. Um, so whatever it is that you're learning, if you, if you dedicate yourself to self-development, you'll learn it better. Love it. Uh, next question. Uh, what are the books you've given most as a gift? Uh, well, that's an easy one. Uh, I've given away 30 copies of Tim Ferriss' Tools of Titans. Um, so basically an incredible compilation of the guests that have appeared in his podcast, but a few other um, credible people as well. And they just share nuggets of wisdom on, you know, it's just very little um, bite-sized things, but they, if you apply it, it changes your life. Um, I think that's a phenomenal gift. The one other book I'd recommend as a generic book that you can't not learn something from is Outliers. That book really opened my eyes and taught me you can do anything. Mm. Um, and, and it goes through all these tangible studies and breaks down all these people we perceive to be unreachable in terms of their success. And you realize, no, actually, that's not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. And when you gave out these 30 copies of Tours of Titans, was this at an event or did you do it as part of a promotion or, or what happened? No, nothing like that. I, I've just been following Tim Ferriss for a very long time. So one, you know, I thought I'd love to support him. But two, I know the value the book would provide. So I just kind of thought what 30 people in my life would most benefit it from this and i just gave it out for christmas mm, what a what a beautiful gesture that's great uh educating the world one book at a time love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh and just just an interesting note here it's up to you uh how you respond to this question of course but i it's i'm sure. extremely curious in this topic and in tools of titans there is a section in there on uh psilocybin and psychedelics yep. ayahuasca and that things of that nature Correct. have you looked into that at all i have so i listened to a podcast actually there's a number of podcasts but i think it was uh sam harris's podcast on tim ferris on the tim ferris show that first uh gave me some context into this where he talks about psilocybin and um, psychedelics in a bit of detail. Mm-hmm. And then he actually went and interviewed two guys very open-minded to it. I'd, I'd actually love to, I haven't I haven't tried it myself, but I'd, I'd love to. Um, mm. and I've, I just think I've become a lot more open-minded after I not only listened to the podcast, but list, uh, read that book as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something I've funded to an extent through something he was running. He's, he was running a fundraiser for um, some research that was being conducted in, in, this, in the sector. And I think it should be looked into a lot more. Mm. I think it's, very, it's a really, it's a shame that we perceive certain drugs the way we do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's influenced not by the right things. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's a that's a whole uh, another podcast. I've got a uh, Johan Hari, also author of Chasing the Screen, where we talk about the war on drugs and how yeah. there's so many misconceptions lying behind these. You know, some people call them medicine, really. Um, and you know, yeah. there's this concept that drugs aren't inherently good or bad, which is something I'm a big believer in. Mm. Um, and just the stories you hear, like in this book called uh, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide by James Fadiman, who is um, also coming on the podcast. He uh, is probably the world's expert on microdose. And the things I've read in there about his experiments, um, the amount of people that have come away from not just microdosing, but actual like, you know, decent doses of these these psychedelics, uh, you know, like, seven, don't quote me on the figures here, but, you know, like 75% of them came away with like a, you know, a, a positive uplifting experience. And, and many yeah. people, even like Steve Jobs said, you know, LSD was mm. in his top three most, you know, life changing experiences taking, yeah. uh, you know, acid. And it, it just really gets my cogs turning. So I just had to spill the beans there. Yeah, no, I think that's such a fascinating thing. Actually, just touching on microdosing, uh, it's something I'd, I'd actually been considering just I, I, just out of curiosity more than anything else. But mm. um, no, I think it's a, it's a really interesting concept. I'd encourage everyone to just learn a bit more about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's a big misconception out there that should be overcome. Yeah, definitely. There's um, just to clarify, we'll do the whole legal thing. You know, we are not recommending yeah. you go out and start, you know, filling up your mouth with psychedelic mushrooms and acid and and then come back to us and say oh that guy told me to so just a disclaimer there no, <laughs> anyway. we're not doctors we don't pretend to be that's right yeah. <laughs> but definitely something worth uh you know exploring in terms of you know society as a whole uh moving on to the next question what purchase of a hundred dollars or less has most positively impacted your life in the last 12 months uh hundred dollars or less okay i'd actually say it was a paid subscription to an app called headspace which is um, basically an app which allows you to it's it's, it's a guided meditation app um, for me dedication uh, sorry meditation is something I've always been open to just because I've heard great things about it I've never quite been able to get into it properly but it was probably this app that got me into it well and through through the app um, you know I went through I think about 60 days of guided meditation every single day and about 45 days in was when I first had my transformative experience I'd say I was always good you know I always felt at peace I always felt motivated afterwards but I, I think I've truly felt the benefits of meditation after about a month and a half. Mm. And it was that subscription that I think enabled me to do that. Okay. Um, could you try to describe sort of what happened at the 45-day mark? Do you think it was a yeah. placebo or was there actually a distinct change? Uh, I don't know. I think it's a short answer. But to describe what I felt is... I just truly felt nothingness, if that makes sense. You know, in, in this day and age, we're just surrounded by all these things in our brain. And, you know, for example, our attention span is getting shorter and shorter and we're getting distracted so much more easily these days. And I'm someone who's definitely fallen into that trap and my mind is just always turning. And it's always busy. Hmm. And I think I truly turned it off for about two or three minutes. Uh, and I don't know how to describe that, it, but it was just like, I don't know, it's just amazing the, the feeling I, ha- I had I had there. And I think it was like true peacefulness, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So it could have it could have been a placebo effect, but mm-hmm. um, it's something I've been able to do a number of times since then. Mm. And I just come out of it feeling a lot better and mm. a lot less stressed. And yeah. Mm. Do, yeah. You, do you feel any like bodily sensations or any ringing in your ears or, or any like distinct sen- sensations at all? Because there are some people who meditate and do feel these after long periods of meditation. No, I can't say I've felt that exactly. Um, Mm -hmm. For me, you know, maybe I just haven't explored it. You know, I haven't gone into transcendental meditation or anything like that. You know, what I've done has usually been guided meditation followed by silence Mm. and just breathing. Mm. But uh, the reason I do it is I start the day and finish the day with meditation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not a lot. It's not a long time. It's maybe five minutes. But Mm. it it just really calms my mind. Mm. And I'm able to, even if it's, you know, five seconds of nothingness, I think that's a lot of value of just, you know, true peace. Whereas you don't really get that at all these days. Mm, sure thing. Uh, yeah, just to add uh, some more value here. I, I went on a 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat in Thailand yeah. last year. And that is like the crash course. Hang on, someone knocking on my door. I'll be right back. I'll cut this out of the podcast. No <laughs> sure. Two minutes. 
All right, we are back. Um, sorry about that. I just had no, uh, right. a postie drop off a book for me, so I might even open that on air at the end of this call. That, that should be interesting. <laughs> cool. So getting back to where I was, yeah, I went on a 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat, and this was like a crash course on straight-up mindfulness. Literally 24-7, we were taught to, for this 10-day course, to just be aware and conscious of our thoughts, which is essentially, you know, what meditation is. It was a 10-day meditation meditation retreat and so we would be mindful of like our our bare feet walking along the grass we'd be mindful of our bodies would be mindful of the thoughts we're thinking and just just watch we became watchers for that whole 10 days uh which was pretty intense and you know i i voluntarily chose not to use my phone throughout the experience um and i didn't talk much either so it was very very solitudous that isn't a word but there there you go i made it up um (laughs) (laughs) and i think it was on day six and we were doing it wasn't vipassana but this thing called i think it's pronounced samati samati or samatha meditation and it's a little bit different to vipassana um and i'm not really good at explaining it because i haven't researched it enough but it's basically yeah you focus on a body part and just stay with that body part um and just just use that as your anchor so when your thoughts go astray just come back to the body part and just just watch and i i think it was uh yeah day six I did some samati for 60 minutes in pure dark. They turned off all the lights. We're sitting in this Buddhist temple, really quite an amazing experience with 40 other people. We all just sat on our mats and we meditated in complete silence and darkness. And when I came out of that, that session on day six, I felt this distinct like 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 buzzing and 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 tingles it wasn't super intense but intense enough to be like holy shit uh this meditation Mm. thing has actually done something um and for me that was quite a surreal experience uh but saying that i haven't actually uh, experienced that since and i don't actually meditate on the reg right now um what i tend to do with my habits going off track here is to introduce a new habit into my life every 30 days once the first one's built up because i'm a big believer in focusing on one thing at a time so meditation uh it may come there, but I, I'm thinking of doing Wim Hof method instead. Oh, um, yeah. No, yeah. I actually went to one of his workshops. Really cool. Ah, could you tell us about that? Yeah, no, I think it was, it was just a promo for his actual course, but it was, it was still very valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, we, we tried a few things with cold therapy and you know, exposing yourself to regular cold treatment. Um, it was cool. Uh, I became a lot more open-minded to that. Again, I was a bit of a skeptic going in, but I was like, you know what? I can, I can really see the value in this, e- even if it's just from a discipline point of view. Um, never mind the health effects, which are certainly quite extensive. Mm. Yeah. Mm, definitely. Wim Hof method is absolutely... Uh... It's just it's, the breathing as well. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The breathing technique. It's bizarre if you get really deep into it. Yeah. Know, I had one of my deepest experiences just two nights ago and I had extremely vivid dreams and, and, and what I felt after like the fifth or sixth round was just crazy. I was literally mm-hmm. hallucinating. I never thought you could do that without ingesting a substance of some sort. Yeah. So it, w- yeah. it was bizarre to say the least. And I still got more experiments to do with that. And, um, we'll, we'll see where Wim Hof method goes. I'm trying to actually get, uh, one of Wim Hof's advisors or something. I think his name's John Duquesne. I sort of got some loose ties with him. So hopefully we can get cool. him on the podcast and delve into oh, that. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Please. Yeah. yeah, it'd be awesome, man. Anyway, enough about me. Uh, the next question for you, Shanika. Yeah, what are your, you've briefly touched on it, but what are your morning rituals? Sure. Uh, it's, it's pretty constant. So basically, I wake up quite early in the morning, you know, 5 to 6 a.m. usually. And I will usually have a cold shower some sort of cold treatment. If it's a really cold day, I might go for a cold run. Um, then I will do about five minutes, five to 10 minutes of meditation, followed by Tim, uh, sorry, the Tony Robbins exercise of priming, mm-hmm. which just gets you really uh, settled, excited, pumped for the day. And then I do a brain dump. So I either do this the night before or in the morning, but I'll just, you know, dump out everything I need to get done. I'll prioritize it. And then that'll be my ritual, basically. Sweet as. We'll jump along right to the next question. Uh, what topic would you speak about if you were asked to give a TED Talk on something outside of your main area of expertise? So obviously I'd speak about education if it was my main one, but I think outside of that, something I'm really interested in is biohacking. Um, mm. It's something I've taken a large interest in over the last year and a half. Um, I'm still learning, but I, I just think it's such a fascinating concept that more people should know about. So that's what I talk about. Mm. Have you learned anything from Dave Asprey? Yeah, yeah, that's the Bulletproof guy. Yeah, I have, certainly. Um, I've read his book as well as listened to a few of his videos. Um, I actually took one of his, um, what's it, what was it called? Unfair Advantage. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was one of his products. Um, it was pretty good. I, I, I felt a difference whether it was placebo or not, but mm-hmm. I 
I certainly rate him and what he talks about. Mm. Have you read his new book, uh, Headstrong? No, I haven't. Mm. Good. Uh, yeah. Okay. It, it's an interesting, uh, you know, a lot of people know already, but Dave Asprey has been sort of hit in the past by Joe Rogan yeah, when he was exposed for some mycotoxin thing. So it's sort of a thing he lives with now. Um, yeah. and my thoughts on that have changed drastically, um, since I've been following him more often and just the way my mindset is. So, uh, I'll go into that on another podcast with someone else, um, just to, sure. to, to, cause this could go many directions, but yes, yeah. um, short answer is, yeah, I do highly recommend recommend the book headstrong there are some absolute gold nuggets in there like man dave asprey despite his past this guy is on the bleeding edge of biohacking here in 2017 like this guy's the future man uh he's like he's like aiming to be 180 years old and the amount of resources he's put into like experimenting with shit is just mind-blowing so you definitely just because of his past you can't discard what this guy's doing it's incredible Uh, no no completely agree just mm. on that note actually something interesting which might sound crazy to most people the age i hope live to is about 500 (laughs) fuck yeah and you know that's just kind of again through what i've learned but i'd recommend listening to a guy called peter diamandis and he he really broke my ceiling in terms of that um he 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 runs a you know billion dollar company around biohacking and extending human Ah. life it's called longevity inc if Ah. anyone is interested okay man um i've i've heard this guy amanda's name everywhere i've never looked into the guy oh he's he's the he's the elon musk no one knows about ah interesting interesting yeah. he is i i you know if i was to go on and talk about him i'd talk for hours but okay the biggest mentor slash motivation of my life yeah well um listeners listening in get a load of that uh because i just did i will definitely yeah. jot that down and have a look at this man he sounds really interesting maybe he's the guy that i heard this other biohacker uh pops like 70 pills a day or something crazy and has a a a goal to live super long or something so maybe it's him i don't know but i'm I'm intrigued Mm. okay thanks for mentioning that all right so we've got a couple more questions here two more uh what is the best or most worthwhile investment you've made now this could be an investment of money time energy or any other resource and how did you make that investment? Sure. Uh, okay. So I'll speak about it in a general sense and then perhaps in a more specific sense as well. In a general sense, it's just been investing in myself. I've read over 300 books, which I've purchased. Um, so that in itself is probably you know, three to $5,000. Um, I don't regret a cent. In a more specific sense, I've spent a very large amount of money um, on mentors and valued courses. So for example, the Tony Robbins course I went to, I then went and bought some of his successor programs, which I'm you know, working through now i'm involved in a mastermind that i got to from that uh they were quite expensive but i I don't regret them in any way shape or form but i think the overlying concept is my big investments have come in myself um but you know you hear a lot about making investments in the stock market and you know diversifying your investments i can see the value in that personally i don't take a big part in it just because i think you know, I'm not looking for a 10 to 15% return on my money. I'm looking for a 300% return. Mm-hmm. And the only way to do that is by growing yourself first. Yeah, for sure. Uh, love it. So the last question here before I ask you where we can find you on social media, uh, and that is, do you have a quote you live your life by or think about often? Yeah, I mean, there's a number a number of them. And just given the people I follow, I think that's going to happen. But a really big one that I heard about a year and a half ago is strong opinions weakly held. And, you know, basically the premise of it is what you believe you should believe strongly and you should live by. But if there ever comes a time where you find something that disqualifies that, you should have no problem changing that opinion. Mm-hmm. So don't don't let pride get in the way, basically. Mm. Um, and I think that's really important because a lot of people naturally, they hold on to beliefs that fundamentally they kind of know are wrong. But just due to this issue of pride or, you know, no, I've already publicly made this statement, they'll hold on to that value or belief. But I think that that's wrong. You've got to, it's important to have strong opinions, but you should be willing to change them very quickly the moment you realize, actually, that's not quite correct. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And I think it was Tony Robbins who said, the one with the most flexibility wins or something along those lines. Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, resonate with what you're saying. Awesome, man. So where can we find you on the world of social media? Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I'm not a...
If you'd like three gold nuggets from the book I'm currently reading, packed into a short, entertaining weekly email, then head to brandonnankavell.com slash subscribe. This is also the best way to interact with me and keep up with what I'm doing. Again, head to brandonnankavell.com slash subscribe. As usual, thank you for listening, my friends. I release new episodes every week. Make sure you don't miss one by subscribing. It's super easy and means a lot to me. Go to iTunes, search for The 1% Show, and click subscribe. Once again, I'm your host, Brandon Nankervell, and I'll see you in the next episode.